everyone and welcome to Soft Stories. I'm Stratton and this is Pepper, returned, rejuvenated and refreshed after her time off, recuperating from her surgery and I think she's happy to be back on the bed again. I, too, am happy for the book that we are going to read together next means a great deal to me. That book is The Borrowers by Mary Norton. It is a classic of children's literature originally published in 1952, though I believe The edition that I am holding in my hands is the 1971 Penguin Puffin paperback. And this copy is special to me because it originally belonged to my father from his childhood. And I remember him reading it to me and my sister when we were young. This book contains the original illustrations by Diana Stanley. Uh, Those of you in the United States may better know the illustrations by the American couple Joe and Beth Clutch, who Uh, illustrated many editions of The Borrowers in the United States. Um, But obviously this is the one that I am more familiar with, and I do enjoy these illustrations very much. The Borrowers is a classic for a reason, and has been reinterpreted as a film many times. I think there are five different uh, adaptations of it on the silver screen, and I think there might actually be an animated series in the works, too. I am most familiar with the American film from the 1990s, which featured John Goodman, although... uh, I know that there was one with Stephen Fry as well. You may also know that there was, in 2010, a uh, Japanese animated film by Studio Ghibli, the famous, and rightly so, animation studio that produced such films as Spirited Away and Howl's Moving Castle. Howls is also an adaptation of a book, uh, and a great one. We might get there eventually. But their adaptation of The Borrowers was called Arietti, or The Secret World of Arietti, depending upon which region you were in. And so it is obviously a story that has resonated for children and inspired imaginations throughout the years, if it can be so often and so well reinterpreted. For those of you who have already experienced this story, I hope you enjoy looking back on it again. And for those of you who have never read The Borrowers, I can't wait to share it with you. So let's dive in to The Borrowers by Mary Norton. The book begins with one of these fabulous illustrations, which you can see here, of Mrs. May and Kate sitting before a warm fire. Chapter One. It was Mrs. May 
who first told me about them. No, not me. How could it have been me? A wild, untidy, self-willed little girl who stared with angry eyes and was said to crunch her teeth. Kate, she should have been called. Yes, that was it. Kate. Not that the name matters much, either way. She barely comes into the story. Mrs. May lived in two rooms in Kate's parents' house in London. She was, I think, some kind of relation. Her bedroom was on the first floor, and her sitting room was a room which, as part of the house, was called the breakfast room. Now breakfast rooms are all right in the morning, when the sun streams in on the toast and marmalade. But by afternoon, they seem to vanish a little, and to fill with a strange silvery light, their own twilight. There is a kind of sadness in them then, but as a child, it was a sadness Kate liked. She would creep in to Mrs. May just before tea time, and Mrs. May would teach her to crochet. Mrs. May was old, her joints were stiff, and she was not strict exactly, but she had that inner certainty which does instead. Kate was never wild with Mrs. May, nor untidy, nor self-willed, and Mrs. May taught her many things besides crochet. How to wind wool into an egg-shaped ball. How to run and fell and plan a darn. How to tidy a drawer and to lay, like a blessing, above the contents, a sheet of rustling tissue against the dust. Why so quiet, child? asked Mrs. May one day, when Kate was sitting, hunched and idle, upon the hassock. What's the matter with you? Have you lost your tongue? No, said Kate, pulling at her shoe button. I've lost the crochet hook. They were making a bed quilt in woollen squares. There were still thirty still to do. I know where I put it, she went on hastily. I put it on the bottom shelf of the bookcase just beside my bed. On the bottom shelf? repeated Mrs. May, her own needle flicking steadily in the firelight. Near the floor? Yes, said Kate, but I looked on the floor, under the rug, everywhere. The wool was still there, though, just where I'd left it. Oh, dear, exclaimed Mrs. May lightly. Don't say they're in this house, too. The what are? asked Kate. The borrowers, said Mrs. May, and in the half-light she seemed to smile. Kate stared a little fearfully. Are there such things? she asked after a moment. As what? Kate blinked her eyelids. As people, other people living in a house who borrow things. Mrs. May laid down her work. What do you think? She asked. I don't know, said Kate, looking away and pulling hard at her shoe button. There can't be. And yet, 
She raised her head. And yet sometimes I think there must be. Why? Why do you think there must be? Asked Mrs. May. Because of all the things that disappear. Safety pins, for instance. Factories go on making safety pins. And every day people go on buying safety pins. And yet, somehow, there never is a safety pin just when you want one. Where are they all? Now, at this minute, where do they go to? Take needles, she went on. All the needles my mother ever bought, there must be hundreds. Can't just be lying about this house. Not lying about the house, no, agreed Mrs May. And all the other things we keep on buying. Again and again and again, like pencils and matchboxes and sealing wax and hair slides and drawing pins and thimbles and hat pins, put in Mrs May, and blotting paper. Yes, blotting paper, agreed Kate, but not hat pins. That's where you're wrong said Mrs. May, and she picked up her work again. There was a reason for hat pins. Kate stared. A reason, she repeated. I mean, what kind of a reason? Well, there were two reasons, really. A hat pin is a very useful weapon, and... <laughs> Mrs. May laughed suddenly, but it all sounds such nonsense, and she hesitated. It was so very long ago. But tell me, said Kate, tell me how you know about the hat pin. Did you ever see one? Mrs. May threw her a startled glance. Well, yes. She began. Not a hat pin, exclaimed Kate impatiently. A, uh, whatever you called them, a borrower. Mrs. May drew a sharp breath. <sighs> no, she said quickly. I never saw one. But someone else saw one, cried Kate. And you know about it. I can see that you do. Hush said Mrs. May. No need to shout. She gazed downwards at the upturned face, and then she smiled, and her eyes slid away into the distance. I had a brother, she began uncertainly. Kate knelt upon the hassock, and he saw them. I don't know, said Mrs. May, shaking her head. I just don't know. She smoothed out her work upon her knee. He was such a tease. He told us so many things, my sister and me, impossible things. He was killed, she added gently many years ago now on the northwest frontier. He became colonel of his regiment. He died what they call a hero's death. Was he your only brother? Yes, and he was our little brother. I think that was why. She thought for a moment, still smiling to herself. Yes, why he told us such impossible stories, such strange imaginings. He was jealous, I think, because we were older and because we could read better. He wanted to impress us. 
He wanted, perhaps, to shock us. And yet, she looked into the fire. There was something about him. Perhaps because we were brought up in India, among mystery and magic and legend. Something that made us think that he saw things that other people could not see. Sometimes we'd know he was teasing, but at other times, well, we were not so sure. She leaned forward and, in her tidy way, brushed a fan of loose ashes under the grate. Then, brush in hand, she stared again at the fire. He wasn't very strong, little boy. The first time he came home from India, he got rheumatic fever. He missed a whole term at school and was sent away to the country to get over it. To the house of a great aunt. Later I went there myself. It was a strange old house. She hung up the brush on its brass hook and, dusting her hands on her handkerchief, she picked up her work. Better light the lamp, she said. Not yet, begged Kate, leaning forward. Please, go on. Please tell me. But I've told you. No, you haven't. This old house, wasn't that where he saw? He saw. Mrs. May laughed. Where he saw the borrowers? Yes, that's what he told us. What he'd have us believe. And what's more, it seems that he didn't just see them, but that he got to know them very well that he became part of their lives, as it were. In fact, you might almost say that he became a borrower himself. Oh, do tell me, please. Try to remember, right from the very beginning. But I do remember, said Mrs May. Oddly enough, I remember it better than many real things which have happened. Perhaps it was. A real thing. I just don't know. You see, on the way back to India, my brother and I had to share a cabin. My sister used to sleep with our governess, and on those very hot nights, often we couldn't sleep, and my brother would talk for hours and hours, going over old ground, repeating conversations, telling me details again and again, wondering how they were and what they were doing. And they? Who were they, exactly? Homily, Pod, and little Arietti. Pod? Yes, even their names were never quite right. They imagined they had their own names, quite different from human names. But with half an ear, you could tell they were borrowed. Even Uncle Hendrieries and Eggletinas, everything they had was borrowed. They had nothing of their own at all. Nothing. In spite of this, my brother said, They were touchy and conceited, and thought they owned the world. How do you mean? They thought human beings were just invented to do the dirty work. Great slaves put there for them to use. At least that's what they told each other. But my brother said that, underneath, he thought they were frightened. It was because they were frightened, he thought, that they had grown so small. Each generation 
had grown smaller and smaller and more and more hidden. In the old days, it seems, and in some parts of England, our ancestors talked quite openly about the little people. Yes, said Kate, I know. Nowadays, I suppose, Mrs. May went on slowly, if they exist at all, you would only find them in houses which are old and quiet and deep in the country and where the human beings live to a routine. Routine is their safeguard. It is important for them to know which rooms are to be used and when. They do not stay long where there are careless people, unruly children or certain household pets. This particular old house, of course, was ideal, although as far as some of them were concerned, a trifle cold and empty. Great Aunt Sophie was bedridden through a hunting accident some twenty years before, and as for other human beings, there was only Mrs. Driver, the cook, Crampfurl, the gardener, and, at rare intervals, an old housemaid or such. My brother, too, when he went there after rheumatic fever, had to spend long hours in bed, and for those first weeks it seems the borrowers did not know of his existence. He slept in the old night nursery, beyond the schoolroom. The schoolroom at that time was sheeted and shrouded and filled with junk, odd trunks, a broken sewing machine, a desk, a dressmaker's dummy, a table, some chairs, and a disused pianola. As the children who had used it, Great Aunt Sophie's children, had long since grown up, married, died, or gone away. The night nursery opened out of the schoolroom, and from his bed my brother could see the oil painting of the Battle of Waterloo, which hung above the schoolroom fireplace, and on the wall, a corner cupboard with glass doors in which was set out on hooks and shelves a doll's tea service, very delicate and old. At night, if the schoolroom door was open, he had a view down the lighted passage which led to the staircase, and it would comfort him to see each evening. At dusk, Mrs. Driver appear at the head of the stairs and cross the passage carrying a tray for Aunt Sophie with bath Oliver biscuits and the tall cut glass decanter of fine old pale Madeira. On her way out, Mrs. Driver would pause and lower the gas jet in the passage to a dim blue flame, and then he would watch her as she stumped away downstairs, sinking slowly out of sight between the banisters. Under this passage, in the hall below, there was a clock, and through the night he would hear it strike the hours. It was a grandfather clock, and very old. Mr. Frith of Leighton Buzzard came each month to wind it, as his father had come before him, and his great-uncle before that. For eighty years, they said, and to Mr. Frith's certain knowledge, it had not stopped. And, as far as anyone could tell, for as many years before that, the great thing was that it must never be moved. It stood against the wainscot, 
and the stone flags around it had been washed so often that a little platform, my brother said, rose up inside. And under this clock, below the wainscot, there was a hole. Chapter 2 It was Pod's hole, the keep of his fortress, the entrance to his home. Not that his home was anywhere near the clock, far from it, as you might say. There were yards of dark and dusty passageway, with wooden doors between the joists and metal gates against the mice. Pod used all kinds of things for these gates, a flat leaf of a folding cheese grater, the hinged lid of a small cash box, squares of pierced zinc from an old meat safe, a wire fly swatter. Not that I'm afraid of mice, Homily would say, but I can't abide the smell. In vain, Arietti had begged for a little mouse of her own, a little blind mouse to bring up by hand, like Egeltina had had. But Homily would bang with the pan lids and exclaim, And look what happened to Egeltina! What? Arietti would ask. What did happen to Egeltina? But no one would ever say. It was only Pod who knew the way through the intersecting passages to the hole under the old clock. And only Pod could open the gates. There were complicated clasps made of hair slides and safety pins, of which Pod alone knew the secret. His wife and child led more sheltered lives in home-like apartments under the kitchen far removed from the risks and dangers of the dreaded house above. But there was a grating in the brick wall of the house, just below the floor level of the kitchen above, through which Arietti could see the garden, a piece of gravelled path and a bank where crocus bloomed in spring, where blossom drifted from an unseen tree, and where later an azalea bush would flower, and where birds came, and pecked and flirted and sometimes fought. The hours you waste on them birds, Homily would say, and when there's a little job to be done you can never find the time. I was brought up in a house, Homily went on where there wasn't no grating, and we were all the happier for it. Now go off and get me a potato. That was the day when Arietti, rolling the potato before her from the storehouse down the dusty lane under the floorboards, kicked it ill-temperedly so that it rolled rather fast into their kitchen where Homily was stooping over the stove. Oh, there you go again, exclaimed Homily, turning angrily. Nearly pushed me into the soup. And when I say potato, I don't mean the whole potato. Take the scissor, can't you, and cut off a slice. I didn't know how much you wanted, Arietti had mumbled, as Homily, snorting and sniffing, unhooked the blade and handle of half a pair of manicure scissors from a nail on the wall and began to cut through the peel. You've ruined this potato, she grumbled. You can't roll it back now in all that dust, not once it's been cut open. Oh, what does it matter, said Arietti. There are plenty more. Oh, that's a nice way to talk. Plenty more, do you realise? Homily went on, gravely, laying down the half-nail scissor 
that your poor father risks his life every time he borrows a potato. I meant, said Ariete, that there are plenty more in the storeroom. Well, out of my way now, said Homily, bustling around again, whatever you meant, and let me get the supper. Ariete had wandered through the open door into the sitting room. The fire had been lighted, and the room looked bright and cosy. Homily was proud of her sitting room. The walls had been papered with scraps of old letters out of waste paper baskets, and Homily had arranged the handwriting sideways in vertical stripes which ran from floor to ceiling. On the walls, repeated in various colours, hung several portraits of Queen Victoria as a girl. These were postage stamps, borrowed by Pod some years ago from the stamp box on the desk in the morning room. There was a lacquer trinket box, padded inside and with the lid open, which they used as a settee. And that useful standby, a chest of drawers made of matchboxes. There was a round table with a red velvet cloth, which Pod had made from the wooden bottom of a pillbox, supported on the carved pedestal of a knight from the chess set. This had caused a great deal of trouble upstairs when Aunt Sophie's eldest son, on a flying midweek visit, had invited the vicar for a game after dinner. Rosa Pickhatchet, who was housemaid at the time, gave in her notice. Not long after she had left, other things were found to be missing, and from that time onwards, Mrs. Driver ruled supreme. The night itself, its bust, so to speak, was standing on a column in the corner, where it looked very fine, and lent that air to the room which only statuary can give. Beside the fire, in a tilted wooden box case, stood Ariete's library. This was a set of those miniature volumes which the Victorians loved to print, but which, to Ariete, seemed the size of very large church Bibles. There was Bryce's Tom Thumb, Gazetteer of the World, including the last census, Bryce's Tom Thumb Dictionary, with short explanations of scientific, philosophical, literary and technical terms, Bryce's Tom Thumb edition of the comedies of William Shakespeare, including a foreword on the author. Another book, whose pages were all blank, called Memoranda. And last but not least, Ariete's favourite, Bryce's Tom Thumb Dictionary and, uh, sorry, Tom Thumb Diary and Proverb Book, with a saying for each day of the year, and, as a preface, the life story of a little man called General Tom Thumb, who married a girl called Mercy Lavinia Bump. There was an engraving of their carriage and pair with little horses the size of mice. Ariete was not a stupid girl. She knew that horses could not be as small as mice, but... She did not realise that Tom Thumb, nearly two feet high, would seem a giant to a borrower. Ariete had learned to read from these books, and to write by leaning sideways and copying out the writings on the walls. In spite of this, she did not always keep her diary, although on most days she would take the book out for the sake of of the saying which would sometimes comfort her. Today, it said, you may go farther and fare worse, 
and underneath, Order of the Garter, Institute of 1348. She carried the book to the fire and sat down with her feet on the hob. What are you doing, Arietti? called Homily from the kitchen. Writing my diary? Oh, exclaimed Homily shortly. What did you want? asked Arietti. She felt quite safe. Homily liked her to write. Homily encouraged any form of culture. Homily herself, poor ignorant creature, could not even say the alphabet. Nothing, nothing, said Homily crossly, banging away with the pan lids. It'll do later. Arietti took out her pencil. It was a small white pencil, with a piece of silk cord attached, which had come off a dance programme. But even so, in Arietti's hand, it looked like a rolling pin. Arietti, called Homily again from the kitchen. Yes? Put a little something on the fire, will you? Arietti braced her muscles and heaved the book off her knees and stood it upright on the floor. They kept the fuel, assorted slack and crumbled candle grease, in a pewter mustard pot and shoveled it out with the spoon. Arietti trickled only a few grains, tilting the mustard spoon, not to spoil the blaze. Then she stood there, basking in the warmth. It was a charming fireplace, made by Arietti's grandfather, with a cogwheel from the stables, part of an old cider press. The spokes of the cogwheel stood out in starry rays, and the fire itself nestled in the centre. Above there was a chimney piece, made from a small brass funnel, inverted. This, at one time, belonged to an oil lamp which matched it, and which stood, in the old days, on the hall table upstairs. An arrangement of pipes from the spout of the funnel carried the fumes into the kitchen flues above. The fire was laid with matchsticks and fed with an assortment of slack, and as it burned up, the iron would become hot, and homily would simmer soup on the spokes in a silver thimble, and Arietti would broil nuts. How cosy those winter evenings could be. Arietti, her great book on her knees, sometimes reading aloud. Pod, at his last, he was a shoemaker and made button boots out of kid gloves, now, alas, only for his family. And homily, quiet at last, with her knitting. And we have here a little picture of that fire. You can see Arietti with her reading, and homily with her thimble on top of the cog, and the scissor used for so many things lying on the ground nearby. Homily knitted their jerseys and stockings on black-headed pins, and sometimes on darning needles. A great reel of silk or cotton would stand table-high beside her chair, and sometimes if she pulled too sharply, the reel would tip up and roll away out of the open door into the dusty passage beyond, and Arietti would be sent after it to rewind it carefully as she rolled it back. The floor of the sitting room was carpeted with deep red blotting paper, which was warm and cosy and soaked up the spills. Homily would renew it at intervals when it became available upstairs, but since Aunt Sophie had 
taken to her bed. Mrs. Driver seldom thought of blotting paper, unless, suddenly, there were guests. Homily liked things which saved washing, because drying was difficult under the floor. Water they had in plenty, hot and cold, thanks to Pod's father, who had tapped the pipes from the kitchen boiler. They bathed in a small tureen, which once had held pâté de foie gras. When you had wiped out your bath, you were supposed to put the lid back to stop people putting things in it. The soap, too, a great cake of it, hung on a nail in the scullery, and they scraped pieces off. Homily liked coal tar, but Pod and Arietti preferred sandalwood. That would be my choice, too. What are you doing now, Arietti? called Homily from the kitchen. Still writing in my diary? Once again, Arietti took hold of the book and heaved it back onto her knees. She licked the lead of her great pencil and stared a moment, deep in thought. She allowed herself, when she did remember to write, one little line on each page, because she would never, of this she was sure, have another diary. And if she could get twenty lines on each page, the diary would last her twenty years. She had kept it for nearly two years already, and today, March 22nd, she read last year's entry. Mother's Cross She thought a while longer, and then, at last, she put ditto marks under Mother and worried under Cross. What did you say you were doing, Arietti? called Homily from the kitchen. Arietti closed the book. Nothing, she said. Then chop me up this onion, there's a good girl. Your father's late tonight. There's another illustration here where we can see Homily at work in the kitchen with Arietti writing in her diary. I love the detail of the little safety pins which are used as clothes lines. That kind of inventiveness, I think, is one of my favourite things about this book. The repurposing of objects brings a smile to my face every time. Let's continue with chapter three. Sighing, Arietti put away her diary and went into the kitchen. She took the onion ring from Homily and slung it lightly around her shoulders while she foraged for a piece of razor blade. Oh, really, Arietti? exclaimed Homily. Not on your clean jersey. Do you want to smell like a bit bucket? Here, take the scissor. Arietti stepped through the onion ring as though it were a child's hoop and began to chop it into segments. Your father's late, muttered Homily again. And it's my fault, as you might say. Oh dear, oh dear, I wish I hadn't. Hadn't what? asked Arietti, her eyes watering. She sniffed loudly and longed to rub her nose on her sleeve. <sniffs> Homily pushed back a thin lock of hair with a worried hand. She stared at Arietti absently. It's that teacup you broke, she said. But that was days ago, began Arietti, blinking her eyelids, and she sniffed again. I know, I know. It's not you, it's me. It's not the breaking that matters, it's what I said to your father. What did you say to him? Well, I just said... There's the rest of the service, I said, up there where it always was, in the corner cupboard of the schoolroom. I don't see anything bad in that. 
said Arietti, as one by one she dropped the pieces of onion into the soup. Oh, but it's a high cupboard, exclaimed Homily. You have to get up by the curtain, and your father at his age. She sat down suddenly on a metal-topped champagne cork. Oh, Arietti, I wish I'd never mentioned it. Don't worry, said Arietti. Papa knows what he can do. She pulled a rubber scent bottle cork out of the hole in the hot water pipe and let a trickle of scalding drops fall into the tin lid of an astrin bottle. She added cold and began to wash her hands. Maybe, said Homily, but I went on about it so. What's a teacup? Your Uncle Henry he never drank a thing that wasn't out of a common acorn cup, and he's lived to a ripe old age and had the strength to emigrate. My mother's family never had nothing but a little bone thimble which they shared around. But it's once you've had a teacup, if you see what I mean. Yes, said Arietti, drying her hands on a roller towel made out of surgical bandage. Oh, it's that curtain cried Homily. He can't climb a curtain at his age, not by the bobbles. With his pin he could, said Arietti. His pin? Well, I led him to that one too. Take a hat pin, I told him, and tie a bit of name tape to the head and pull yourself upstairs. It was to borrow the emerald watch from her bedroom for me to time the cooking. Homily's voice began to tremble. Your mother's a wicked woman, Arietti. Wicked and selfish, that's what she is. You know what? exclaimed Arietti suddenly. Homily brushed away a tear. <sniffs> no, she said wanly. What? I could climb a curtain. Homily rose up. Arietti! You dare stand there in cold blood and say a thing like that? But I could. I could. I could borrow. I know I could. Oh, gasped Homily. Oh, you wicked heathen girl. How could you speak so? And she crumbled up again on the cork stool. So it's come to this, she said. Now, mother, please, begged Arietti. Now, don't take on. Oh, but don't you see, Arietti? Gasped Homily. She stared down at the table for loss of words. And then, at last, she raised a haggard face. My poor child, she said. Don't speak like that of borrowing. Oh, you don't know, and thank goodness you never will know. She dropped her voice to a fearful whisper. What it's like upstairs. Arietti was silent. What is it like? She asked after a moment. Homily wiped her face on her apron and smoothed back her hair. Your Uncle Hendreary, she began. Egaltina's father. And then she paused. Listen, she said. What's that? Echoing on the wood was a faint vibration, the sound of a distant click. Your father! exclaimed Homily. Oh, look at me. Where's the comb? They had a comb. A little silver 18th century eyebrow comb from the cabinet in the drawing room upstairs. Homily ran it through her hair and rinsed her poor red eyes. And when Pod came in, she was smiling and smoothing down her apron. And that, my friends, is where we will leave it for today, at the end of Chapter 3 of The Borrowers by Mary Norton. Thank you so much. For joining us for this. I have so enjoyed these first chapters 
and look forward to more of The Borrowers soon. I look forward to seeing you as well. Thank you for joining me. And until next we meet, I wish you all the best and goodbye.